Well, good morning. As always, I'm excited to be here and to be together with you as we gather here in this gorgeous sanctuary on a beautiful Sunday morning and to celebrate our faith, to give thanks to Almighty God for God's goodness and graciousness to each and every one of us. Uh, if you are visiting with us today, please know that we consider you to be our guest. And we are grateful that you would choose Central as your place to worship today. We hope you feel welcome and comfortable here. We hope you feel a, a taste of God's presence and love and grace. But thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. Also, an extra word of welcome to those joining us online. Uh, some of our own folks join us when they can't be here, but we have folks from... I even know of one person in Texas who tunes in sometimes and watches us, uh, I guess just for the amusement. But uh, we're grateful. We're grateful for whatever the reason might be. So, uh, messy church. We're getting messy this afternoon. Uh, everyone's invited to come if you want to check it out and see what it's all about. But it's particularly uh, orient oriented towards families and children and things like that. But it's good for all ages. Uh, thank you for, to those of you who volunteer to be a part of this, uh, but it's this afternoon in the fellowship hall, and if you have children, grandchildren, if you have uh, neighbors who have small children, invite them, bring them. They will be grateful that you, that you did that. Uh, tomorrow night we have a finance committee meeting. Everyone who's on the finance committee, uh, we're grateful that you would make an effort to be there. Also, the preschool is going to begin classes tomorrow. Our official launch of the preschool is now here and they will begin in the morning. Something that we are excited about. Sometimes, some, something that was a long time in the making to the help, with the help of many of you. All right. Last but not least, we have a very special guest and I have to say this, this resume that I'm reading here is one of the most impressive things I've read in a long time, and I think you'll agree with me. So today we are fortunate to have with us in worship today, Zoe Kushabar with the violin, and it's nice to meet you, and it's great to have you here. So here we go. Zoe is a 2020 graduate of Converse University, majoring in violin performance and chemistry. Wow. Wow, that makes me sweat just reading that, actually. She's also a 2022 graduate of Florida State University with a Master's of Music and Violin Performance. And tomorrow, she leaves for College Park, Maryland, where she will begin work on her DMA in Violin Performance at the University of Maryland. So we are truly honored and privileged to have you with us today. Thank you. And with that, let us continue our time of worship.
Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to join me now in our confession of faith. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, our teacher, example, and redeemer the Savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God found in Scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. We believe in the Church, we who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. I invite our children forward at this time. Thank you for coming up here. So I want to ask you, have you ever seen or played sports like soccer or ballet? You played soccer, ballet, karate, any other sports? Soccer? Oh, and basketball too, of course. Um, so. Have you ever noticed that when you play those games, they all have rules? Like soccer, there's a rule about your hands. Only the goalie can touch the ball with their hands. That's right. And other, other sports and stuff have, have rules too. And lots of rules. Like in football, they all wear helmets to protect their heads. Is there one for karate, a good rule for karate? Uh, don't slap the bags during classes. You're supposed to punch them. So you have to know all those different rules, right? But sometimes, if you're in a game, have, have you ever had somebody get hurt during a game? Or practice? Yeah, that happens sometimes. And you know what happens when, those, when that happens? Everything stops. And the rules don't matter. Somebody might pick up the soccer ball because somebody's hurt. Because is a soccer ball more important or the person who's hurt more important? That's right. The person who's hurt is more important than the soccer ball. And you know what? There was a story kind of like that with Jesus in our Bible lesson for today that I'm going to read. Somebody 
needed some healing and there were some rules, but Jesus knew that the person was more important than the rules. That being with that person and showing his love and healing that person was more important than the rules. And so I want y'all to remember, rules, rules are important too. They help us know how to get along with one another. They help us know how to play the games. But more important than the rules are the people around us. All right, can y'all pray with me? Dear God, thank you for Jesus and his example of love. Help us remember that people are more important than the rules sometimes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as part of our joys and concerns this morning, we are going to make a special presentation and a, and a special recognition. As many of you know, we lost one of our beloved staff members just a couple of weeks ago, Ann Darby. She passed away, and she had worked here, I believe, 17, 17 or 18 years. A long-standing presence here in our church and in our congregation. Well, this morning, we want to recognize her and I'm going to invite uh, Jim Hasty, who's the chair of our staff parish relations to committee to come forward and Chuck Hawkins who was the love of Ann's life and took amazing care of her um, all during this past year because she really became pretty sick back in February was right there by her side every moment and is here to receive this recognition Several weeks ago, Reverend Treese, Janet Wilson of the Finance Committee, and myself organized a love offering for Ann Darby. Our plan was to have a rapid campaign and deliver the gift to Ann. Ann's untimely death made us change our plans. Today, we present this gift to Chuck Hawkins, Ann's longtime surviving partner. Chuck, when you open this envelope, I believe it'll be apparent how much Ann Darby meant to Central. Her encyclopedic knowledge of every aspect of Central's business affairs greatly benefited everyone she interacted with. Anne's professional demeanor and pleasant personality made her a pleasure to work with. I ask that everyone stand, pay respect to Ann Darby's 17-year contribution as financial secretary of Central Methodist Church. Chuck, thank you. Thank you all. Chuck, thank you. We're praying for you. Yeah. Thanks for all the cards, memories. She had a lot of memories here. She loved y'all. She loved to come to work. She missed coming. She missed coming to work. She tried to figure out how she could come back. <laughs> Wanted me to come get paperwork, bring it to her. She just loved her job, and she loved the people at this church. And thank you, Cam, for coming in when you did. She always said, I think I talk too much. <laughs> so, no, and she was like a kid in a candy store when you come to talk to her. Thank when you started telling her about the stuff, thank she you. loved it. Thank she you. loved it. And thank y'all. Thank you, everybody, for everything. I appreciate it. And she appreciated it. And she loved everybody in this church. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. I'm praying for you, man. Thank you, man. Yeah, like I said, she, she really appreciates it. I'm going to talk to you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. 
I know Ann and Chuck were inundated with many, many cards and flowers over the last few months, and Ann would always tell me how much she appreciated that, um, knowing that people were thinking about her and praying for her and remembering her even though she couldn't be here. So um, they're very grateful for all that you have done. As we uh, continue uh, looking at our joys and concerns, a few prayer requests um, to, to, to keep in mind. So Bob Morrison uh, fell and, and uh, broke some bones, had reconstructive surgery, uh, is in the hospital but doing very well. Uh, he's doing very well uh, from the surgery. And one announcement that I, I, I truly hate to make uh, but Danny Smith uh, wanted me to let you know that his wife, Becky, her cancer has returned. And um, they're pretty devastated about this diagnosis, and she will begin treatments and surgeries to try to address this. But anyway, he wanted all of you to know, and um, I promised that we would keep Becky and Danny and their family in our prayers over, over the long months and journey that they have ahead of themselves. As always, I invite you to take a moment and look through the, the list of names in your bulletin under, under prayers. All of these folks have asked that we remember them in our prayers and their families, so I just continue to invite us to do that throughout the week. And with that, let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty and gracious God, we are grateful that you search for us, you seek us out, you notice us in our times of joy, but also in our times of difficulty and even desperation. We're grateful that you take the initiative in reaching out to us and blessing us even when we're not sure we should reach out to you, even in the midst of our own doubts and fears and struggles. Oh God, you are good to us, and your love continues to seek us and bless us. Oh God, we give you thanks for Ann Darby and for what she has meant to this church for so many years, keeping our financial house in order and doing it with a wonderful attitude and a great love for her job and the people she worked with and, and served with. We're thankful for her. We're thankful for Chuck. Oh God, we remember all those whose names are printed in our bulletins today. We remember their families. We offer a special prayer for Bob Morrison as he recovers and heals from his surgery and is in the hospital. Oh God, we pray a special prayer for Becky Smith that you will be with her as she faces this new trial in her life. Bless her doctors and those who will make critical decisions. Grant them wisdom and guidance and direction. We pray that whatever treatments or whatever surgeries she may have, that they will ultimately be successful in curing her and ridding her of cancer, this feared and dreaded disease. Give Becky and Danny and their family courage and strength and grace to handle this time with faith. Bless all those whose names are printed here. Bless their families and their caretakers. God, help us to entrust to you all of our worries, our frustrations, our disappointments, our failures and setbacks, into your kind and gracious hands. Help us to entrust all things and all people into your will and care. Help us to live as those who may not know what the future holds, but we know the one who holds our future. God, we're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who would cross boundaries and borders and break rules to show your great love and mercy and compassion to your people as we remember the prayer which he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I invite our ushers to come forward, please, that we may receive our morning tithes and offerings.
A reading from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 13. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days to be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things he was doing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
I think I may have told you that when I came here, someone very gently informed me that if I ever preached a poor Sunday on a Sunday morning, don't worry about it because the music will more than make up for it. So I feel doubly encouraged today with um, what we've experienced so far. All right, so I don't normally call attention to my sermon title, but I'm going to today because it is actually the title of a song, kind of. The real title of the song is just simply Signs. And it was a song that came out in 1970, and the refrain is, sign, sign, everywhere, a sign. A lot of you probably know that song. It was a very popular song when it came out. However, I do want to give a little pop quiz this morning. Can anybody tell me the name of the band? Wow, the Five Man Electrical Band. John Quackenbush, congratulations. Um, I have to say I'm stunned. I did not expect that this morning. <clears throat> huh? Yeah, I did not expect that. Anyway, uh, I was reminded of this song as I pondered our scripture lesson for today, believe it or not. And if you don't remember the lyrics to it, I'll just refresh your memory a little bit by reading some of them. I'll do you a favor and not attempt to sing them, but I will read them to you. And it begins like this. And the sign said, long-haired freaky people need not apply. So I tucked my hair up under my hat and I went in to ask him why. He said, you look like a fine upstanding young man. I think you'll do. So I took off my hat. I said, imagine that, huh? Me working for you. Sign, sign, everywhere a sign. Blocking out the scenery, breaking my mind. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the sign? And then it goes on. And the sign said, anybody caught trespassing will be shot on sight. So I jumped on the fence and yelled at the house, hey, what gives you the right to put up a fence to keep me out or to keep mother nature in? If God was here, he'd tell you to your face, man, you're some kind of sinner. And then it reads, now, hey you, mister, can't you read? You've got to have a shirt and a tie to get a seat. You can't even watch. No, you can't eat. You ain't supposed to be here. The sign said you have to have a membership card to get inside. And the sign said, everybody welcome. Come in, kneel down, and pray. But when they passed around the plate at the end of it all, I didn't have a penny to pay. So I got me a pen and a paper, and I made up my own little sign. I said, thank you, Lord, for thinking about me. I'm alive and doing fine. Sign, sign, everywhere a sign. Blocking out the scenery, breaking my mind. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the sign? Well, I was reminded of this song because it seems like Jesus has not read the sign today. The sign that read, do not heal on the Sabbath. We find Jesus teaching in a synagogue, which was often his custom, and he was recognized as a rabbi, so he would be there on the seventh day on a frequent basis. And this time while Jesus is teaching and speaking, probably on some scripture lesson, he spots someone, and it seems like he just stops dead in his tracks. He sees someone maybe kind of hustling uh, dragging through the back of the sanctuary and he sees a woman who's bent over unable to straighten herself. Now we're not told how old she is. We probably assume she's an older adult but we don't know that. She perhaps could have been born this way. All we know is that she's been stricken with this this problem, this disability for at least 18 years. Maybe an injury, maybe a disease. We don't know what happened to her. But all we know is that Jesus sees her and he stops and he calls out to her to come forward. And I can imagine how, how stunned she must have been to be called out by this famous rabbi, this teacher. I wonder how many times she has shuffled through that same synagogue every Sabbath day, no one talking to her, 
No one paying her any attention. No one noticing her. But Jesus notice, notices her. For most people, she's probably been invisible. Yet Jesus sees her. He calls out to her. He touches her and in effect blesses her and sets her free. And she stands up straight. He restores her body and he restores her dignity. And everyone can see this great miracle. They've seen this woman for all these years. They know that a miracle has occurred and they praise God for it. But not everyone. Here comes the president of the synagogue. And in kind of a passive aggressive way, he doesn't address Jesus directly, but he kind of shouts out to the crowd, hey, don't come in here on the Sabbath to be healed. There are six days, other days, where you can come and be healed. For him, what has occurred on this day is a violation of the Sabbath. Now, if you know much about the Old Testament, you know that according to the law of Moses, the Sabbath and all of the rules surrounding the Sabbath were considered to be serious business. It was then, and it even is today. Being one of the Big Ten, the Big Ten Commandments, we read in the book of Exodus this, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. The word Sabbath comes from the Hebrew word Shabbat, which simply means rest. It's a day of rest. But like most laws, they're not just left open to interpretation. Commentaries and commentaries had been written by Jesus' day on what exactly it means to honor the Sabbath. Lots of rules and lots of policies and regulations being very specific about what is allowed and what is not allowed on the Sabbath. What you can do and what you cannot do. When I was in Israel, I had a couple of interesting Sabbath experiences. One was on a Friday evening. I was, I was in Israel two years ago, uh, February of 2019, and we were in Jerusalem which is certainly the more, most orthodox of, of, of all the places in Israel. So anyway, it was a Friday evening. I'm guessing it was about five o'clock, I'm not sure. And we were riding around in our tour bus. And all of a sudden we noticed that cars were just rushing by and speeding and passing one another. And then right in front of us, two cars collided at a stop sign. We watched the two drivers get out yell at each other for a few moments, jump back in their cars, and take off. And we asked our tour guide, well, what, what is going on here? He said, it's almost sundown. It's almost the Sabbath, and everybody is rushing to get home for the Sabbath. Those two guys that had the accident, they just yelled at each other and said, we'll fix this later. We got to go. And so they left. The other experience that I had was actually on the Sabbath. <coughs> I woke up, was coming down an elevator for breakfast. And of course I got in, I pushed the button to the first floor, but I noticed that every floor the elevator stopped and the doors opened. Whether there was anyone there or not, every floor it stopped and opened and then closed. And I finally got down to the first floor and so I went up to someone at the, at the front desk and I just said, I don't know what's going on, but that, I only pushed the first floor and that elevator stopped at every single floor. He said, oh, that's, what, that's how we program it for the Sabbath. Uh, pushing buttons is considered a violation of the Sabbath. So on the seventh day, we make the elevator stop at every floor so that nobody has to push a button. I certainly never had heard of that, didn't know that, but found that to be quite interesting. Well, the Sabbath was meant to be a gift, a true gift. It was never meant to be anything oppressive or repressive. Today in our scripture lesson, Jesus is going to have none of this. He introduces an argument, starting with the lesser to the greater. He says, look to the, to the crowds. He said, do you not untie your ox or your donkey on the Sabbath, 
so that you can lead it to water. Well, why should I not untie, in a sense, this daughter of Abraham, this precious child of God, that she may be freed from her burden on the Sabbath? You hypocrites, you will do these things for your own animals, but you will not allow me to do this for a daughter of Abraham. You know, Jesus attributes <coughs> her suffering and her disability to Satan, which at least means that it wasn't of God. It at least means that it was never God's will, which many would have assumed in Jesus' day. They would have seen it as a punishment for maybe something she had done or her parents had done or whatever. No, God's will is the opposite of bondage. The kingdom is about healing and freedom, dignity and wholeness. Again, I've repeated this many times, but I have to go back to it. It reminds me of Jesus' personal mission statement, the one he declared in Luke 4, when he took out the scroll, the Isaiah scroll, and he read these words, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the Jubilee year. This is Jesus' mission statement. This is his <coughs> platform, if you will. This is what he was sent to do. Today, Jesus is making good <coughs> on his mission statement. Yes, today Jesus is making good on his mission statement. He has set someone free. Now, you know, this is not just a good mission statement for Jesus, but I would say that this is probably a pretty good mission statement for the church as well. But I wonder, I wonder what most people think of today when they think of church. In other words, if you were to go around downtown Spartanburg and just randomly ask people, hey, when you think about the church, or when you hear the word church, what comes to mind? Or to just randomly ask people, what would you say the purpose of the church is? What has been your experience of church? I wonder if they would say something along the lines of Jesus' mission statement. Today, everyone celebrated except the synagogue ruler. All he could see was a violation, a breaking of the rules, rules over people. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, Jesus is also accused of violating the Sabbath, but in a very different type of circumstance. In that story, Jesus' disciples are out walking through a field, and they're hungry, and they begin to pluck off the, the heads of grain and just casually eat it as they go through the field. Someone saw them doing that. It happened to be the Sabbath. And so someone criticized Jesus' disciples for, quote, working on the Sabbath by plucking the heads of grain. And in Jesus' defense of this, he makes what I consider to be one of the most radical claims uh, or radical statements in all four Gospels because the, the application for this is so broad. He said, the Sabbath was made for human beings not human beings for the Sabbath. Now, when you really think about that, that's a powerful statement. In other words, religion and faith <coughs> is not meant to be oppressive or restrictive or controlling or diminishing, but it is meant for human flourishing. It's not meant to detract from life. It's meant to enhance But how often do we hear God and religion cast in negative terms? What is allowed? What is forbidden? What is God against? Paul writes in Galatians, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Today, Jesus frees this disabled woman. He sees her as a daughter of Abraham, 
desiring nothing but wholeness and kindness. <coughs> when I went to work for Verizon Wireless, as many of you know, I quit the ministry in 2011 and went off and got a job in a customer service call center. And when I went to work there, I never told anybody what I had done in my previous career. Never told anybody that I had been a pastor for 17 years. I really didn't want, you know, people have their own expectations and impressions of what a pastor should be, and I didn't want anybody laying that on me. I just wanted people get to get to know me for who I am. So I never told anybody I was a pastor. But every once in a while, <clears throat> church or churchgoers would come up in conversations. And I still never told anybody that I had been a pastor before. <clears throat> Two conversations have always stuck in my mind, both very similar. Uh, that I heard from people uh, who I was working with at Verizon. One had been a bartender and the other a waitress. They both were in their 20s, <clears throat> I would say. And I can't remember the exact words, but they both were talking about their previous jobs as a bartender or a waitress. And in both instances, they both stated how much they truly hated working on Sundays. And I was like, yeah, why is that? Because in their experience, Sunday dinner church people were often the most demanding and the rudest people and were often the worst tippers. Now, <clears throat> that was all news to me, but they were as serious as they could possibly be. And I thought, wow. Of course, that's strictly anecdotal. I haven't done a, a study or, or research on that, but from those two individuals, that was their impression. And it certainly got my attention. When I was at St. Matthew United Methodist Church in Greenville as the senior pastor, I started to get complaints from longtime members regarding the crucifers and the acolytes on Sunday morning and what they were wearing on their feet. Most of the acolytes and crucifers were between the sixth grade and the twelfth grade, and some had begin, begun wearing Crocs. You remember Crocs? All three of my kids wore Crocs. They still might, I don't know. Or flip-flops. Kids were wearing these. And yes, they were still wearing the prescribed robes and the white gloves to hold the cross. They were still doing that, but underneath all of that, you could see their Crocs or their flip-flops. I never noticed, but it was consistently brought to my attention. <clears throat> Those well-meaning longtime church members wanted me to sit down with these young people and reprimand them reprimand them on their inappropriate dress on Sunday mornings. And it all came to a head during a worship committee meeting. You're the senior pastor. You need to do something. Well, unfortunately for them, they had the wrong pastor when it comes to being worried about proper Sunday morning attire. <clears throat> I told them, number one, you should be thankful that we even have young people in this church. A lot of churches don't have young people. Secondly, you ought to be thankful that, they, thankful that they are willing to serve as acolytes. The only thing I'm going to say to them is thank you. Thank you for your service. Last July and August when I arrived here at Central, the Staff, Relations, Staff Parish Relations Committee had organized a series of gatherings on Monday nights uh, with me and, and many of you, kind of a small group thing. I think it was uh, seven or eight weeks that we did this, and many of you were there. And during those small gatherings, basically my goal was to, to ask you, you know, what are your dreams and what is your vision for Central United Methodist Church? And I would just listen, listen and learn. And that's what I did for most of those Monday evenings. But I remember on one particular Monday evening, I believe it was near the end, Someone asked me, well, what would your vision, what would your dream be of Central United Methodist Church? And I can't remember exactly <clears throat> what my exact words were, but I said something to this effect. My dream or vision for Central would be that I could walk downtown, enter any restaurant or any of the local stores, and I could just randomly go up to an employee or an owner of the store or the restaurant and just say, hey, you know that church uh, on Church Street next to the Montgomery building? What can you tell me about that church? And my dream would be 
that they would respond something like this, oh, you mean central. That's the church that actually practices what it preaches. And it's had a huge impact on downtown Spartanburg. I once heard someone say, good news is supposed to be good news. Our story today is indeed good news, but it wasn't for everyone. Not everyone. And so to me, maybe this scripture lesson begs a particular question for us to ask as individuals, but also as a corporate body, the church body itself. When people see us as disciples of Jesus, do they primarily see what we are for, or do they primarily see what we're against? Amen. <clears throat> And now may the grace of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship and the power of God's Holy Spirit bless each of you today and every single day. Amen. <clears throat>